Welcome to the last Econ talk, Econ Club talk of this semester. Thank you so much for showing up. I know it's really nice weather outside. So, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Professor Stephen uh, Mirren shortly because, because uh, we a little bit trying late. Uh, you probably know the rule, if you want to go get seconds, uh, feel free, anytime, it's normal. So, uh, so Professor Stephen Mirren, uh, he is uh, he's the director of uh, uh, Western Hemispheric Trade Center at Texas A.M. International University. This school is located in Loretta, Texas. When I looked it up, I found out that it actually has two parts. It has American and Mexican part, right? It's right on the border. Oh, all Mexican, okay. It's uh, very interesting. Uh, also, Professor Mirdan, uh, he is a social professor of economics at, uh, um, I just want to make sure I'm going to say it right, Bo Bo Bodin College? Bo Bodin College? Yeah. Bodin College since 2008. Uh, Professor Mirren got his PhD in economics from Duke University. He worked at Bowling Green State University, also Williams College, also the Inter-American Development Bank. And I think that's really cool fact about you that uh, you, you're a Fulbright Scholar in Colombia and Mexico. It's pretty cool. I want to go to Colombia and Mexico. <laughs> and uh, I've been just told I should, I should not go to Cuba. So, uh, Without any further ado, please welcome Professor Mir. Thanks, thanks Leo, for that nice introduction. And uh, thank all of you. Uh, thanks to the Loyal uh, Economics Club for inviting me. I've never been to this campus before for a long time, but it's a, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be back. Uh, I was walking around, and uh, I was thrilled to see the, the uh, flyer for my talk. Uh, with me, there's my picture there uh, in black and white, just below the lovely color uh, flyer for a Nestle Crunch Bar. And I understand that actually. That's uh, most people's view of the relationship of American economic thought uh, to economics in the present day. Economics in the present day has obvious salience. Why do we study the history of economic thought? Why do we study the history of American economic thought in particular in the 19th century? before the professionalization of economics. It's not obvious uh, why this is relevant, yet it's uh, long been interesting to me, uh, delicious like a Nestle Crunch Bar, even as others uh, haven't necessarily seen it. Like that. But I think we're at a moment when a, even economists who wouldn't normally have an interest in the history of American economic thought uh, might see the relevance of it. Uh, and it's because uh, in economics, uh, in growth theory, there is a renewed interest now uh, about the roots of American economic growth. Why I say here that we focus on early thinking, uh, pardon the, uh, the redundancy, early thinking about economic development, uh, well, uh, there was a paper presented that got a good deal of publicity at the uh, American Economic Association meetings in January in Chicago. Uh, titled, Ideas, Are Ideas Getting Harder to Find? Uh, <clears throat> it reflects an anxiety uh, within the economics profession, I think within American society at large. It is, uh, can we continue uh, to have the technological progress, the world technological dominance uh, that we've had for a long time now? Uh, <clears throat> did steam engines and internal combustion engines matter more than smartphones do, is a way to put this question. Steam engines and in internal combustion engines, uh, the uh, engines, as it were, of the second industrial revolution uh, led to big gains in productivity uh, and fueled American economic growth for generations thereafter. Of course, we've seen technological progress since then, and we see a good deal of technological progress in the present day. But is it relevant? Does it matter as much? Uh, does the kind of technology that's embodied in a smartphone uh, really matter so much as the internal combustion engine did? did it, uh, do, will it uh, produce the same kind of uh, gains to, uh, to, to GDP? Will it fuel economic growth uh, the way those earlier innovations did? 
Uh, and what about America in particular? Why focus about early development thinking in the United States? Well, the United States, as one prominent economic historian uh, has put it, is the nation which has carved out the technological frontier for all developed nations since the Civil War. Uh, <clears throat> the anxiety uh, that I think we feel is really related to the question, can we still do that? Are we still fit to do that? You know, I, was, uh, I just moved to, to Texas. Uh, so when Leo was introducing me as a, as a kind of a, a, a Texan, I'm only a Texan of uh, three months tenure. I hardly know Texas. I'm traveling around to get to know Texas. I went to Houston with my kids just a couple weeks ago. And like uh, everybody, I guess, uh, who visits Houston, I visited the Johnson Space Center. Uh, people come from all around to visit the Space Center. Uh, this uh, monument uh, to American technological capability. Uh, and you take the trolley ride and uh, you, uh, you hear uh, about the, uh, the achievements of uh, a couple of generations ago when we put men in space and on the moon. Uh, and as I was looking at this, I thought that Johnson Space Center was, I, I looked at it as a symbol of national decline. I, I did. Uh, the, the, the campus, which was modeled originally as a university campus, a place where we could share ideas, uh, was, to my view, about the worst fourth-rate campus. I mean, it was ugly. It was rather untended. There's no art anywhere. Uh, I just, is this a, a, a place for people to, to enjoy sharing ideas, to do it productively? It didn't look that way to me. Uh, when I got to know another part of Houston, I took my kids a day later to the central part where there's a uh, Herman Park, the zoo, Rice University, and the medical campus. Now that's uh, where we're putting our resources. You can see it. You can see it in the, the affluence that's in the air and that's manifest in the buildings. Uh, <clears throat> so, again, what, what I saw, I'm trying to say, is a reflection of a more general anxiety. Does the United States still have what it takes uh, to produce the kind of gains uh, to production, uh, the kind of advancement uh, that we saw in the last couple of generations? Uh, people wonder, is there still something exceptional about the United States? Well, uh, in this context, uh, we might well look to past economic thinkers in the United States. It may be interesting for the people asking these questions to reflect upon the way that long past generations of Americans posed and answered the questions, because they did. Uh, they thought there was something exceptional about the United States. Uh, <clears throat> and they figured, too, that the United States needed a system of political economic ideas to understand what was exceptional about the United States, which was the way that it produces ideas, and the way that those ideas are translated into economic growth. Right. Uh, this notion uh, of uh, the exceptional nature of the United States, uh, and <clears throat> the way that that exceptional nature is built upon uh, the production of and dissemination of ideas uh, was even reflected in literature, in, say, Moby Dick. Uh, Melvin uh, has a nice quotation in Moby Dick uh, where he describes in detail what the whale fishery looks like. Herein, it is the same with the American whale fishery as with the American army and the military and the merchant navies and the engineering forces employed in the construction of American canals and railroads. In all these cases, the Native American is not uh, speaking about indigenous uh, Americans, American Indians. Uh, he's talking about people born in the United States. Uh, and born in the United States, uh, partaking of whatever is exceptional in the United States. In all these cases, the Native American liberally provides the brains of the rest of the world as generously supplying the muscles. So there's something special about the United States. Above all, it's the way that Americans uh, produce ideas. It's their ingenuity. Uh, and uh, this has some consequences to economic growth. <clears throat> and therefore, 
Americans need a different political economy, different from the political economy of the old world. This is why, actually, uh, American economic thought in the 19th century, to me, is so interesting. We generally don't study it. Uh, when you uh, look to history of economic thought uh, textbooks, uh, what you uh, see is a uh, growing treatment of Americans after the professionalization of uh, economics, when uh, economics became more of a credential discipline, uh, when the American Economic Association was established in the 1880s. Uh, then, beginning at that moment, uh, <clears throat> there's an interest in studying American economists. Uh, the interest is not so much in studying American economists and their ideas before that. To me, that's exactly when it's fascinating. American economic thinkers in the 19th century figured that they needed to distinguish themselves uh, from their British and European uh, counterparts. And they needed to do it because they lived in an exceptional place uh, where there were different rules of the uh, One American political economist, and he is not one of the ones I want to focus on today. I've written about him. Uh, I find him interesting for, for other reasons. Uh, but one of these uh, political economists uh, wrote a letter to one of the big dudes uh, of economic thought, David Ricardo, uh, <clears throat> in the early 19th century. Uh, appreciating Ricardo's work, he wanted to put himself in communication with Ricardo, express his admiration, and also at the same time express his aspirations for a political economy in the United States. Let me pause for just a moment. Uh, and uh, speak a little bit about David Ricardo uh, and uh, one of the central aspects uh, of his system, his theory of rent. I want to describe that because uh, this is one of the things, one of the main things about Ricardo uh, that this American political economist, Connie Reguet, uh, has in his mind as he's writing to Ricardo, and it's also the point of departure for a lot of American political economists, the most creative ones, the ones who want more than others to develop a different system of American political economy is <coughs> this aspect of Ricardo's thought, his rent theory in particular, that they're going to take issue with. All right, so uh, a little tangent, uh, but one that's important to the discussion that follows. Uh, Ricardo's rent theory is one where he calls us uh, to imagine uh, a physical geographical space uh, with land of different qualities. Uh, imagine it as a space uh, with uh, three concentric circles. And the land in these three concentric circles uh, has a different intrinsic quality. The quality manifest in the yield of crops that are produced with a constant application of labor and capital. Uh, <clears throat> when, when people, and there are going to be a few of them from the start, uh, <clears throat> sell a new place, they're going to concentrate themselves on the best land. Uh, this is land uh, marked Roman numeral one, and I shade it a little darker uh, to signify uh, that it has the greatest intrinsic quality. There are a few people, uh, there's this wide open space, of course that's where they're going to go first, they're going to cultivate that land, they're going to cultivate the land, their numbers are going to grow, uh, and eventually uh, they're going to have to spread out, they're going to have to go somewhere else. Where are they going to go? Uh, not to the worst land not to Roman numeral three, then they're going to go to Roman numeral two, the second best land. Well, as soon as they go <coughs> to the second best land, as soon as uh, the extensive margin of cultivation goes from <coughs> circle one to two, <coughs> so that the, the land quality at the extensive margin is medium, not high, then people are going to bid up the value of land uh, where it's better in one. The reason for the value of land uh, and the rent that will be paid to land uh, in uh, the high quality land that I've marked Roman numeral one is precisely because people have had to extend themselves out to the lower quality land. And so then, uh, <clears throat> as the population continues to grow, and they have to spread themselves out further now. 
uh, they go to the still lower quality land. Uh, <clears throat> this bids up the value of the land, and so the rent that is paid uh, for the use of land uh, in the medium quality, number two area, and it bids up even higher, the price that's paid for the land, the rent of land, in the high quality, the Roman numeral one area. This is the cornerstone of uh, the Ricardian system. The Ricardian system is bigger than this, but this is at the heart of the Ricardian rent theory, and this is what Americans are going to start taking issue with, start to tinker with, uh, in one way or another. And this is what is in the forefront of Condi Reguet's mind as he writes to Ricardo, and he says, yeah, your work on the principles of political economy has been read here with interest. Uh, it's to be hoped that on this side of the Atlantic, we shall be able to produce some authors who may give additional lights particularly as it relates to the progress of wealth in a new country. We've got a new country. Maybe political economy, maybe the progress of rent, progress of growth is going to work differently here uh, than it does in Great Britain and Europe. Uh, that's a common notion that Americans have. All right. So overall, uh, just to preview what I'm going to talk about here, uh, I am going to... Uh, <coughs> I'm going to take some exemplary figures uh, in the history of American political economy in the 19th century. Uh, <clears throat> some of the most creative figures. I don't think of Condi Reguet actually as being one of the most creative figures. Uh, he has an idea that the United States needs a new and different political economy. Maybe he thinks uh, that the production of ideas uh, should uh, be important to American political economy political economic thought, um, but uh, he doesn't really accomplish it. Uh, there are other figures who accomplish it rather more, and I'm going to focus on them. I'm going to talk about uh, how these different figures tried to build uh, a distinctively American political economy, how the production of ideas was at the heart of their systems of political economy how some other factors were important as well. This is something that they have in common. Uh, one of them is the centrality too, not just about <coughs> the importance of ideas, the way that ideas uh, are the wellspring of economic growth, but also the relevance of the frontier. If there's something important about American, Americans, there's something about, uh, important about America and, and the people that populate it, it's partly uh, their ingenuity, but it's also the interaction of their ingenuity with the existence uh, of an open frontier. Uh, <coughs> And all of these guys have uh, some notion about the relevance of the frontier. It's what I would describe as an ambivalence uh, about the frontier. And I want uh, to, uh, to show you uh, how the frontier matters, why they're ambivalent. Uh, and also another factor of American economic development thinking uh, that these four figures exemplify is the political element in economic theory. Now this is an illusion. Uh, to a 19th century work uh, by another uh, important economic theorist, uh, Gunnar Myrdal, who won the Nobel Prize. Uh, he wrote early in his career a book uh, titled The Political Element and the Development of Economic Theory. And what I've done in my title is uh, given a spin on that. Uh, <clears throat> right? the, uh, the, the Political Element and Theories of American Economic Development is my title. One of the things that I intend that title to do is to refer to the way that uh, American economic development theory always had the political purposes of the theory pretty close in view. Gunnar Myrdal's project in this book in the first half of the 20th century uh, was to unveil uh, the political element, uh, the, the value-ladenness of economic theory, which he thought was disguised to economists. One of the things that I need to say that is characteristic of American economic development thinking in the 19th century is that uh, the value ladenness of it was partly disguised. Uh, the political element was always close to you. Right? So these are the, the, the features, the centrality of ideas, uh, the wellspring of economic growth, right? the relevance of the frontier, uh, which also amounts to an ambivalence about the frontier, uh, and the political element. The, the politics of the theory being close in view. And that's very uh, closely related to the fact that uh, at this time, political economy was not a credentialed uh, profession. Uh, who were the political economists 
In many cases, uh, they uh, were politicos, uh, they were journalists, um, that is, they were engaged with uh, political ideas uh, and polemical works, as well as an effort to develop political economy. Poor my guys. Uh, here they are. Uh, Tench Cox uh, was a representative for the Continental Congress, uh, also later assisted uh, Alexander Hamilton in uh, the writing of the famous report on manufacturers. You've probably heard of Hamilton, you've probably heard of the report. Uh, Tench Cox actually helped to write it. Hamilton himself is another one of my figures. Henry Charles Carey is something you might not have heard of. Uh, he was a tremendously uh, important in his day. Uh, American political economist, widely read uh, the, uh, the economic theorist of the Whig Party and the early uh, Republican Party, the Whig Party under the second American Party system, uh, the Republican Party of the third, uh, beginning in the mid 19th century, and uh, Henry George. Uh, Henry George, uh, another uh, famous American political economist, world famous uh, in his day, actually still. Uh, has something of a, of, of a following, um, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, not widely remembered or read in political economy curricula today. There's a niche, actually, within political economy, uh, within people who are interested in, in past economic ideas. Some of them are interested in these guys. Some of them are. Uh, <coughs> There's a uh, there's a uh, there's an economist uh, in England at uh, at uh, Cambridge uh, named uh, Hajun Chang, who wrote a book uh, titled "Kicking Away the Ladder." Uh, there's uh, another uh, economist uh, who has worked at the University of Missouri at Kansas City. Let me see if I can pull this book out here. Uh, and uh, has done a lot of consulting too, named uh, Michael Hudson. Um, <clears throat> ha Jun Chang is very interested in Friedrich List, uh, who spent a, a time in the United States, uh, who at that time, uh, early in his career, was engaged with uh, the ideas of Henry Carey's father, uh, uh, <clears throat> and Carey himself. Uh, <clears throat> List uh, took these ideas back with him to Germany. Uh, he was a, a protectionist, had some ideas about how protectionism could engender the development of ideas and thereby economic growth. Uh, what I mean to say is that uh, there are scholars, economists, uh, like Ha Jun Chang, uh, like Michael Hudson, who's written this book, America's Protectionist Takeoff, includes references to some of these political economists, including Carey. Uh, they're interested in him. They're interested in him for different reasons. Uh, <clears throat> so these guys are mostly forgotten, uh, not so much Hamilton, a big musical about him. The rest of them are mostly forgotten within economics. Um, there are some people who do remember remember them. They remember them uh, because they see their ideas uh, as uh, as representative of what American uh, economics should be. They think their ideas are right, to put it simply. Uh, it might surprise you to hear me say that I don't really care so much. That's not my project. Uh, is to tell you whether they're right or wrong. Uh, what I'm interested in is what their ideas were and where they came from. Why did Americans uh, think about economic development as they did? How did they think about it? Why did they think about it as they did uh, in the 19th century? That's really it. Uh, I don't want to tell you uh, whether the way they thought was right or wrong. I don't know. So let's uh, start with uh, Tench Cox. Uh, he wrote a, uh, a work in uh, 1787. Of course, uh, 1787 is the moment when uh, the United States is deliberating uh, over a constitution. And he wrote an inquiry into the principles upon which a commercial system for the United States of America uh, should be founded. Should be founded. Uh, and how that system uh, should be embodied in the Constitution of the United States. The powers of our national government uh, presently in 1787 <clears throat> were unequal to the complete execution of any salutary purpose, foreign or domestic, 
the natural resources, as he saw them, of the United States were immense. They were great. Uh, but without some positive policy of developing them, uh, and also with uh, the burden of uh, excessive consumption, as he saw it, people were too interested in consuming luxuries. Uh, uh, those uh, natural resources uh, would not be productive. Uh, what was needed was a greater diversity of employments. People needed to do things other than uh, produce crops uh, and engage in commercial services, trading those crops uh, for goods from Britain and Europe. Especially what Americans needed uh, was manufacturing. Tenchcox developed an early version of what became known as the home market argument. Why were manufacturers important? Manufacturers were important because they developed a market for agriculture. Maybe a bigger market than existed in Britain and Europe, maybe a more reliable market. How did that work exactly? Uh, it wasn't entirely clear in Tench Cox's thought, uh, but the notion uh, was there. On one side, we should see our manufacturers encouraging the tillers of the earth by the consumption and employment of the fruits of their labor. Uh, <clears throat> an important idea of his was that one of the advantages of a manufacturing sector really was uh, that the demand for agriculture would be more stable. And you can imagine uh, how at a moment of tremendous uh, political and commercial instability, uh, American economic thinkers would have been interested in. Uh, that is to say that uh, it's not just the extent of the demand for agriculture that is important to Americans, it's the stability of the demand for agriculture. And if a domestic manufacturing sector uh, uh, can constitute a more stable demand for agriculture, then that's a good thing. Uh, this notion, too, is embodied, but it's also elaborated in Hamilton's report on manufacturers. And it should be no surprise uh, that Hamilton's report echoes a lot of what Tench Cox was saying in that inquiry because, as I said before, Cox was one of the authors uh, of the report on manufacturers. He assisted in writing it. In the report, uh, Hamilton, with Cox's help, says that the diffusion of manufacturers has the effect of rendering the total mass of useful and productive labor in a community greater than it otherwise would be. So, by the diversification of industry, we can make all industry more productive. There are some kind of spillovers uh, between the agricultural and the manufacturing sector, uh, and above all, from manufacturing to agriculture. If you have manufacturing, it makes agriculture more productive than it could possibly be without it. Uh, and so the entire mass uh, of labor is more productive than it would be uh, if there were more specialization uh, according to the United States' relative advantage, which was probably agriculture and commercial services. So uh, by giving a greater scope uh, of the introduction of machinery to the division of labor, that's one way that the diffusion of manufacturers or renders the total mass of a labor more productive. Also, by providing better insurance against the injurious interruptions of foreign markets, uh, when uh, foreigners start shooting at each other, start shooting cannons at each other's ships, uh, and they, uh, they interrupt commerce, uh, then that injures the United States, that interrupts the demand for agriculture, that's no good. Uh, and so the diffusion of manufacturers domestically helps there too. Uh, also, and here's an interesting thought, another reason why the diversification of employments the diversification of industry matters is because people differ. People uh, differ innately. Uh, one person uh, may be uh, innately good uh, at uh, standing behind a team of oxen and uh, plowing the ground. Uh, another person uh, may be uh, innately good uh, at, uh, at uh, pounding uh, metal on an anvil. Okay? Uh, and if we then have manufacturers in addition to agriculture, we can give those people who differ in their innate talents uh, more opportunities to specialize in what they're innately good at. Right? So by affording more varied opportunities for people with varying talents, 
and could be seen in exclusively agricultural or commercial, commercial societies, uh, as Hamilton and Cox put it in the report, the community is benefited by the services of its respective members in the manner which each can serve it with most effect. Right. So there were similarities between uh, Cox uh, and Hamilton, but there were also differences. And those differences emerged when a war with Great Britain threatened. What was their reaction? They had different reactions. Uh, <clears throat> Hamilton's reaction was that he thought uh, it was time uh, to uh, cut a deal. Uh, <clears throat> Great Britain was at war with France. Uh, this was uh, at the era of the French Revolution and in the beginning uh, of the wars of the era uh, of the French Revolution and Napoleon. <coughs> Uh, because of uh, the war between Great Britain and France, commerce with the United States was interrupted. American ships and seamen were seized. It made Americans angry. And they were increasingly ready to go to war. Hamilton uh, wanted to avoid a war with Great Britain. Uh, he wanted to cut some kind of a deal uh, with Great Britain. And this was the reason for the Jay Treaty of 1794. There were other Americans who were loath to compromise, did not want to cut a deal, wanted to exert uh, American uh, force. Uh, <clears throat> if the British and the French uh, are going to frustrate American commerce, uh, we ought to frustrate them back, or maybe not trade with them. And that was more Tench Cox's attitude. No deal. Why no deal? How can the United States get along uh, without commerce? Between, Great Britain, between itself and Great Britain and or France. Well, the United States remained the only well-ordered and sober republic. The American Republic uh, had gained something in opening the human mind. Let's not, let's not bow down uh, to the European. We don't need them so much. We're special. We're exceptional. We're ingenious. <clears throat> We have a frontier. Let's populate. Let's not look abroad and uh, and uh, try so uh, so hard uh, to maintain a trade with Great Britain and France at great expense to us. Uh, let's instead populate the frontier and find there the resources to substitute for the loss of British uh, and French trade. Okay. Uh, so here are some, uh, some early ideas of uh, really early uh, American economic thinkers uh, from the moment of the independence of the United States. And again, what I'm endeavoring to show you uh, is how the production of ideas was central uh, to their notion of uh, oh, what American political economy should be, and how Americans are special, uh, and also uh, that the frontier is something, too, that uh, Americans have that is special. Uh, and there's some kind of interaction uh, between this ingenuity and the frontier. Uh, but also an ambivalence about the frontier. And I think you see that ambivalence in this difference between Hamilton and Cox. Uh, Hamilton's eagerness uh, to cut a deal with Great Britain uh, to maintain commerce between the United States uh, and Britain and France, uh, and uh, Cox's notion that uh, it's not so uh, there's another American economic thinker of a generation later who uh, develops all of these ideas uh, much more than uh, Cox and, and Hamilton have done. Another uh, supremely creative uh, economic thinker. In fact, I think uh, this guy, uh, Henry Carey, is one of the most creative American economic thinkers we've ever had. Um, <clears throat> And, uh, and he too, uh, like Condi Reguet, not one of the more creative American economic uh, had this notion that uh, American political economy uh, had to reflect the special nature, the exceptional nature uh, of Americans. And it was going to then uh, depart from British and continental ideas and in particular, it was going to depart from Ricardo. And it was going to depart from Ricardo's rent theory. Kerry was an Anglophobe. Uh, 
Uh, he was uh, the son of uh, <coughs> Matthew Carey, who had emigrated uh, from, uh, from Ireland uh, to the United States uh, <coughs> after being imprisoned in, in Ireland uh, for uh, advocating in a very uh, hot-headed, uh, vocal way, uh, protection uh, in Ireland against British manufacturers and even suggesting that some of the people who resisted him uh, were traitors not to be hung. He, uh, he was a, a newspaper man, uh, and uh, there's a famous illustration uh, in uh, his newspaper in Ireland, the Volunteers Journal, in which he shows one of these, uh, <coughs> these uh, Irish politicos who uh, have allegiances to England being, uh, being hung from the gallows for being a traitor. Uh, well, it was, of course, uh, <coughs> the... Uh, it was, of course, the British uh, who thought that uh, he was a traitor uh, and who imprisoned him. He had to flee to the United States. Uh, and he started over his career in the United States. Uh, and then had a son uh, who had some of the same ideas. Uh, the, uh, the same feeling of uh, anglophobia, the uh, same instinctive uh, reaction against the British political ideas and economic ideas. And the economic ideas of David Ricardo in particular, and Ricardo's rent theory. Okay. Carey uh, wrote that uh, Ricardo's uh, system is one of demagoguery. Now, how did this? I mean, what the, where's, the, where's the demagoguery in this? Right. Well, this is what uh, Carey proceeded to, to show. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, I call uh, Carey's theory a, a pyramid theory. Uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to understand uh, Carey's alternative to the Ricardian rent theory uh, and to, to see why it's, uh, why, it's, why it's relevant to American economic development, you have to think of a, of a, of a pyramid. That's his model. That's a pyramid. Uh, and this is not just me saying so. This is Carey himself. In another work, uh, after his first one, uh, which was titled The Magnum Opus of the Past, the Present, and the Future, 1846. He had another work, he was very prolific, uh, in a work of his uh, multi-volume work titled Principles of Social Science. Uh, he represented, again, the pyramid theory, uh, and he did it with illustrations uh, that I've exerted here. Um, and you can see here in this nice illustration uh, that he's referring again to Ricardo in particular as he develops his alternative rent theory. Okay, so what is it? Um, <clears throat> it's not the case, uh, according to Carey, and uh, the history of, uh, of all the world, but especially in the United States, where there's still an open frontier, you can still see how settlement works. It's not the case. The settlement works as Ricardo described it. People actually don't settle first uh, the land that is most productive. This is all wrong. This is all wrong, and it gives you wrong ideas about the way development works, and it leads to wrong thinking about appropriate policies. How does the progress of settlement and development work? Right? Well, uh, Ricardo places his early settlers at the point mark B. Right? See what we've got here? Uh, we've got a couple of mountains. The mountain is like a pyramid, a couple of uh, adjacent pyramids. <clears throat> that space between the pyramids, well, the pyramids are mountains. That space between the pyramids is a river valley. Where is the land most intrinsically valuable, intrinsically productive of agriculture? You know, the river. Now, Kerry says that uh, you don't settle that first. Think about it. Uh, the first people uh, to, to, to sludge through uh, mud and ice and snow and uh, get to a new area, these first uh, pioneers, these settlers, they don't go straight to the most productive land. They can't, because the most productive land is down by a river. It's uh, maybe swampy. Uh, it has the tallest trees on it. Uh, this is really hard uh, for people to clear. Um, Leo mentioned that I spent a, a little bit of time in Bowling Green State University. This is right. I spent uh, one semester there. Um, and uh, during that short time, I learned about uh, the the settlement of uh, that part of northern and uh, northwestern Ohio is really remarkable. Uh, it was swamp. It was swamp. And the people who went there, oh, good Lord, they, they, they all got malaria. It must have been just miserable. But what they managed to do 
was they drained that massive swamp, a gigantic uh, and arduous undertaking that produced hugely fertile and productive land. But that took time. It was hard. Uh, <clears throat> you wouldn't want to try to do it alone. You'd just get malaria and die, okay? <clears throat> that's, that's Kerry's idea. Uh, <clears throat> this is where the most productive land is, but the first settlers, they can't cultivate it. It's impossible. Uh, so, uh, what they do is they go to the less productive land that may be at the top of the mountain. Right? So, here's Kerry's idea by contrast. Here's the pyramid. Right? Uh, my uh, density of these trees uh, represents the intrinsic quality of land for purposes uh, of producing crops. Let's imagine a model in which there are different stages, uh, <coughs> different uh, time periods. Uh, <coughs> there are two different kinds of uh, people. Uh, there are farmers and then there are workers. Uh, <coughs> now, in time period number one, there are a few people, and all those people are farmers. Uh, <coughs> and they go up to the top of the mountain. That's where it's possible to cultivate crops. They kind of scratch out a living in the dirt. All they've got is their fingertips, right? Seeds in, the, uh, in, in very shallow soil. Right? Uh, that doesn't produce such a great living, uh, but uh, enough of a surplus, maybe, over time, for the population to expand. As the population expands, <clears throat> what you can do is take some of those people and diversify your employments. You no longer just uh, need to have farmers. You can take some of the agricultural surplus and you can support a worker who doesn't raise crops. Uh, he builds tools. And with the tools, maybe he makes uh, other things. Makes other things that uh, could be used perhaps in agriculture uh, to help produce crops. Okay, so now we've got people who are actually doing the farming. And now we've got people who are manufacturing things uh, for use by those farmers, which might make them more productive. And so <clears throat> they produce a surplus. The population grows. As the population grows, there are more of these guys. Uh, <clears throat> and they can allocate even more of their numbers uh, to, our, to uh, manufacturing work, uh, which again spills over into the productivity of the agricultural sector. <clears throat> And as uh, their productivity in agriculture grows, as their capability by virtue of their manufacturing prowess uh, to cultivate land increases, they can cultivate better land. This is exactly the opposite of what Ricardo was talking about, according to Perry. So they move further and further down the pyramid. Right? It's because of the happy farmer's combination uh, with the uh, manufacturers that he's able to exercise the power of concentration. He discusses with them and his other fellow citizens the building of public works and institutions. Uh, and it's this concentration, in its turn, that promotes the growth of wealth by enabling him more and more to acquire knowledge, the study of nature, and so forth. Again, we Americans are special people. Right? <clears throat> Uh, we need a political economy that reflects uh, how we're special. We can see, because development is happening right before us, we're a new country. We can see better than the Brits and the Europeans how it really works. Uh, and how it works is by way of not just population growth, population growth, the diversification of industry, and the creation of ideas that promotes uh, greater productivity. Uh, in a natural state of things, uh, he wrote, uh, the people of the United States can manufacture things more cheaply than any nation in the world. All that's wanted is that the shoemaker with his lapstone, the manufacturer, shall be permitted to take his place by the side of the hides and the food, uh, <clears throat> the agricultural producer, as he would long since have done but for the existence of a disturbing force of prodigious power. Now, here, is where you see that other element of American economic development thinking that I mentioned before, the way that the politics uh, are always close in view. What Kerry is doing is he's developing a theory to justify a protectionism in trade policy. And he wants to characterize protectionism 
as, in his own words, freedom of trade. There's a free trade versus protection debate. What Kerry wants to do is enter into that debate and rob the free traders of their own rhetoric. They call themselves free traders. They're not. <clears throat> I am the free trader. It is my policy, the one that I espouse, protective tariffs uh, for domestic manufacturing, I mean, tariffs applied to foreign manufacturers in order to support uh, domestic manufacturers, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, engenders uh, freedom of trade, because it will uh, permit the shoemaker with his lapstone to take his place by the sides of the hide, by the hides and the food. It will promote the diversification of industry, uh, which in turn uh, promotes uh, the growth of uh, productivity. Uh, I think I better bring up on. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'm going to uh, speed through uh, Carrie and I'm going to get to uh, to Henry George. Uh, what I could talk a little bit more about uh, is uh, the importance of the frontier uh, to Henry Carey, uh, his ambivalence uh, about the frontier. But I'll treat that very very briefly. Uh, just to say that when Carey wrote his magnum opus uh, in 1846. Uh, this is uh, just at the moment of the beginning uh, of the Mexican War, uh, the U.S.-Mexican War uh, <clears throat> that uh, was fought uh, over the, uh, the annexation of uh, Texas uh, by the United States. The United States went to war with Mexico uh, over this. Kerry's party, the Whig party, uh, was <clears throat> uh, ambivalent about that. In fact, they were generally uh, in opposition uh, <clears throat> to the war. Uh, but they saw it uh, as a war that was really in the interest of expanding the political power uh, of the South and expanding the domain of slavery to which they were opposed. So the extension of the frontier was something they were terribly ambivalent about. Uh, they apprehended that the extension of the frontier uh, would amount to the, the growing uh, power of the, of the slave states. Um, again, uh, there is a political cause that he has close in view, and it's the reason why he's worried about the premature uh, settlement of the frontier. He wants to pe keep people concentrated. He wants uh, to, uh, to settle completely this pyramid uh, rather than impel people to fly off the pyramid before it's fully developed. In order to do that, you have to give appropriate incentives for people uh, to develop the manufacturing sector in tandem with agriculture. Let me move on. Uh, to Henry George. He's the third uh, thinker that I want to concentrate on. Uh, <clears throat> another journalist. Uh, <clears throat> if Henry Carey uh, was the son of a, a newspaper publisher who actually later became uh, the most important book publisher uh, in the United States, the publishing house of Matthew Carey, which was taken over by uh, Henry Carey, was for a time in Philadelphia the biggest and most important in the United States. That's where he got his start. And that was not unusual uh, for American political economists. It was, of course, uh, at a time when uh, economics was not a credential profession, common to get one's uh, start uh, uh, outside of uh, academic training. Same was true for Henry George, an autodidact uh, and a, uh, a newspaper editor. Uh, before he wrote his magnum opus, Progress and Poverty, uh, in 1879, uh, Henry George is known uh, for his advocacy of a single tax on the rent of land. That was his big idea, his big reform. Henry Carey had a big idea, right? It was protection. Uh, and his entire theory uh, was built in order to justify that policy. Again, the political ends are always close to people. Same, in a way, uh, with Henry George. Uh, he had a political end was very close in view, and, and he sought to modify, to adapt the, the political economic theory uh, of uh, Great Britain uh, and continental Europe uh, in order to justify uh, that great political reform. A single tax of 100% uh, on the uh, annual returns to land. Why was that uh, such a tremendously important uh, reform? Well, we have to go back to Ricardian rent theory to understand and why Ricardian rent theory is wrong, according to the American political economist. 
Now, according to Kerry, it was wrong for a different reason. Uh, did I just say that right? No, I didn't. I said according to Kerry. I meant according to George, Henry George, it was wrong for a different reason uh, uh, than uh, Henry Kerry uh, had in view. Right? Actually, uh, Henry George largely liked it. He largely agreed, largely, but not entirely, uh, with <clears throat> the Ricardian rent theory. Uh, what really worried him uh, was one little bit of it that he thought was amiss, and then the combination of that little bit that was amiss with the Malthusian population doctrine, this notion uh, that uh, the means of subsistence only grows uh, arithmetically, uh, while population grows geometrically, uh, and so people are always going to be held uh, to the margin of subsistence. As their numbers grow, they starve and they die. Right? This is what bothered him or George. Ricardo, as he put it, furnished the Malthusian theory and additional support by calling attention to the fact that rent would increase as the necessities of increasing population forced cultivation to less and less growth land. In this way, it was formed a triple combination uh, by which the Malthusian theory has been buttressed on both sides. Uh, he's also referring to something called the wages fund uh, theory. Uh, uh, the previously received doctrine of wages and the subsequently received doctrine of rent. Okay. Uh, what was wrong, uh, according to Henry George, uh, oh, with uh, the Ricardian rent theory? It was right, he believed, uh, <coughs> that uh, population would grow, and uh, with the growth of population, an ever greater share of product uh, would be, would be uh, given over to rent. Th that's, the, that's the most basic idea, and uh, in that respect, he agrees with Ricardo. But there's something that he doesn't agree with. Uh, <clears throat> he doesn't agree that this part is terribly relevant. He doesn't agree uh, that uh, these differences in intrinsic land quality uh, are super relevant. What Henry George says is that if we're to think about the progress of development, we need to rethink, kind of like Henry Carey did, the way the entire business works. And uh, whereas Henry Carey invites you to think of a pyramid with people settling uh, at the top of the mountain, the pyramid, instead of first at the bottom, gives you the reasons why. Henry George says, no, don't think of a pyramid, think of a featureless plane. A featureless plane. Uh, a plane that's so featureless that it doesn't even include <coughs> uh, differences in the intrinsic quality of land. It's really featureless, just the unbounded savannah, as he puts it. So think of the unbounded savanna. What's going to happen? Population grows. Uh, the first person that's going to settle is just going to settle somewhere randomly. He's going to stake out a, his claim to a bunch of land. The next person who comes is going to settle where? Um, he's not going to settle uh, over there on the other side of the room from Professor Block, believe it or not. He's actually going to want to be really close to Professor Block, so they can, you know, share ideas, camaraderie, companionship. <clears throat> now that's really good for Professor Block, right? He staked out his claim, and uh, now the second guy who comes uh, wants to be next to him. Well, he's going to have to, he's going to have to pay something to him. Uh, <clears throat> and then the third guy is going to want to be there too. Why? Because of ideas, because of the growth of ideas because of uh, how they can share, disseminate, uh, produce collectively ideas, uh, and how that, in turn, attracts other people. Right? So, it, so what does happen is that, uh, that uh, people go uh, from, uh, ultimately, as population grows, uh, uh, one becomes very densely settled, and, and then people spread out to two, uh, and pay a rent on one, uh, and then two becomes more densely settled. People spread out to three and pay rent on two and even more on one, but it's not because of the intrinsic quality of land, principally. Principally, it's because of the economies of agglomeration. Okay. So uh, this largely goes, uh, just as it did for Ricardo, except for the intrinsic quality of land at the extent of margin is who cares? The same, as far as we're concerned. What, now, what, what, is it, what does that imply? That implies for George uh, that maybe there's something we can do 
maybe there's something we can do that we should do uh, that <coughs> the people who followed the Ricardian uh, rent theory might not have observed. Malthusian theory in combination, he needs to say, with the Ricardian rent theory carries the demand for reform because poverty, want, and starvation are by this theory not chargeable either to individual greed or societal maladjustments. They're the inevitable result of universal laws. But if it, it works rather differently, then really all we need to do is tax Professor Block, right? He keeps getting, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he collects more and more rent, but why does he collect more and more rent? Because he was the first guy to settle there. And now he just look at it. He just kind of sits back and he, he collects it. He just, he just, all he needs to do is sit there and collect the rent. Um, um, what is he, what is he appropriating the returns to? The value uh, of everybody being together uh, in a place. But that's not something that he produced, that's something everybody produced collectively. So the rent uh, should be appropriated collectively. Hence Henry George's one big reform, 100% tax on the annual value of rent. All right, I think it's time for me to speed through this. Isn't it, Leo? About done here? Okay. Uh, all right, uh, this is uh, I, I, uh, a, uh, a recent uh, <coughs> News article that I read uh, brought all this uh, brought all this to mind. It was uh, this uh, article I read in the Onion. Right? <laughs> New report finds moving to isolated seaside cottage uh, greatly increases productivity. Right? Uh, when you first read this and you look at the image, uh, you think uh, it, it's this kind of you think it's the kind of a joke um, <clears throat> that uh, is funny uh, because uh, it's uh, obviously true, albeit in an exaggerated way. Right? Uh, we're also distracted nowadays. It might be your first thought. We're also distracted nowadays that maybe your productivity would go up if you could just move uh, to somewhere where you'd be apart from people. This is just an exaggeration of that view. Your first thought uh, might be that's what makes it funny, but actually, that's not uh, what the authors of this story have in mind. That's not why they thought this was funny. You can go and you read on the article, and they said the effect was even greater. If the house was furnished only with a horsehair mattress on the floor and a single cast iron pot for cooking all your meals. Okay. The reason why it's funny is not because it's so obviously true in an exaggerated way, it's because it's so obviously wrong. If you were to move to an isolated seaside cottage, uh, you would not be more productive. You would be vastly less productive uh, because you're away from everybody, precisely because you're away from everybody. Uh, this, in fact, was Henry George's view. Uh, there is a value uh, to people being near uh, each other. Uh, and uh, the value springs from their ability uh, to produce and disseminate easily amongst uh, each other uh, ideals. So again, once again, you see the importance of the production of ideas uh, to American theories of economics. Uh, so summing up, what can we say uh, in sum about American development thinking by the 19th century's end? Uh, here are the, the takeaway points uh, for me. Uh, first, by the end of the 19th century, the continental uh, geographical frontier was closed. Right? The idea that uh, America was different uh, and needed different political economic ideas uh, was waning. You can already see that, I think, in, in Henry George, who's anticipating uh, by about a decade, uh, the final closing of the frontier. Um, uh, to Henry George, this is really the way it worked, uh, not just in the United States, uh, but in Great Britain as well. And the value that we have of disseminating ideas, sharing ideas, that's something that Americans have in common with people everywhere. So uh, this notion of American exceptionalism in their ingenuity is diminishing. Ingenuity and invention, per se, still play a central role. And uh, for this generation, uh, at the end of the 19th century, there was still a good deal of optimism as to Americans' ability to carve out the technological frontier, if there were the right policies, uh, carve out the technological frontier, as uh, Robert Gordon, one of our present day uh, economists and economists. And still, uh, for Henry George, as for Henry Carey, Tench Cox, and Alexander Hamilton, the political, economic, uh, and economic theory is still very close in view. 
Subsequent generations would downplay it. Uh, with the professionalization of uh, economics, uh, economists uh, became uh, increasingly uh, eager to present themselves as uh, scientists uh, and uh, perhaps uh, to, uh, to diminish uh, or at least to paper over uh, <coughs> their, uh, uh, their, their, the influence of their values in their economic theory. Uh, but the 19th, uh, toward the end of the 19th century, uh, still this uh, political element uh, was, uh, was very close. So uh, this, is, uh, this, is what, uh, this is what characterized American economic development. I think. Uh, my hope is that uh, uh, the present uh, generation of American economists who are interested in uh, the history of American economic development, because they're anxious uh, about uh, whether American progress, whether American exceptionalism uh, in its progress can be maintained, uh, they can look back and, and perhaps uh, learn something from these, these earlier generations. I'll leave it there. to resolve the problem of the harassment of American commerce. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the solution uh, that was tried in a, a few different varieties uh, during uh, Jefferson's presidency was one form or another of non-intercourse or an embargo of trade uh, between the United States uh, and Great Britain uh, and France. And uh, the thinking uh, was that uh, perhaps we can avoid war uh, if we curtail trade. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, if we curtail trade and avoid war, uh, we can develop these immense national resources uh, that we have at home. There were two different uh, lines of thinking of uh, our ultimate purposes in doing this. And uh, I think uh, Tench Cox's idea of the ultimate purpose differed uh, from that of uh, Jefferson himself. Uh, <clears throat> Jefferson himself uh, had the notion that we might curtail trade uh, temporarily in order to demonstrate uh, to Europeans uh, American resolve uh, and the cost to them of harassing American commerce. If you're going to harass American commerce, Let's see how you like it if there is no American commerce. And then maybe you'll stop screwing with us. <clears throat> and Jefferson reasoned, uh, well, there, maybe there's this uh, additional benefit of our doing so that it will impel us uh, to develop more uh, our uh, domestic resources. Uh, the thinking of the likes of Cox was rather the reverse. Uh, was that, oh, hey, uh, here's an opportunity to develop our domestic resources. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the Democratic Republican uh, Party under uh, Thomas Jefferson had people of, of, of both of those different inclinations uh, who agreed upon uh, the, uh, the immediate policy of, uh, of deliberately uh, impeding commerce between the United States and Great Britain and France, which was already being impeded by them. Settle where it's productive, and it's just one thought that the valley was more productive, and the other thought the mountain was more productive. But there wasn't a substantive difference between them. No? There wasn't? No. I think, uh, well, I, 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 no, I, I think there is, because, um, <clears throat> because uh, what, what Carrie is describing is a whole process of uh, growth and development. And uh, according to the whole process, 
what you see uh, is uh, the, the, uh, the, the interdependence uh, and the value of the interdependence of manufacturers and agriculture that, uh, that you don't see uh, in, uh, in Ricardo. Uh, there's, uh, there's not the, uh, the suggestion of, much less the prominence of, uh, these, uh, the, these spillovers, these technological spillovers uh, from the uh, agriculture to the manufacturing industry, which increases the productivity of the whole world. It's true. There's that difference. Mm -hmm. But there's also a similarity. And the similarity is that they both agree that you settle first in the productive land. It's just they define productive land differently. One said it was the valley, one said it was the mountain. That's a good point. Now, that's, that's a very interesting point, I think, is that, uh, <clears throat> to my view, uh, Henry George uh, has more in common with David Ricardo, this uh, figure whose ideas he wants to adapt in adapting them and depart from them. Uh, more in common uh, with David Ricardo than uh, Henry Carey has. But you could actually look at it the other way. Uh, by your way of thinking, uh, which I, makes some sense to me, uh, you could see, in fact, Carey, although he hates Ricardo, thinks he was a demagogue, Thinks his, uh, thinks his, at the very least, his theory was an instrument of demagoguery. Uh, Kerry may have had more in common with him uh, than uh, Henry George did. Henry George thinks, dude, you can sell it wherever. It doesn't matter. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. Yes? I, I guess two things come to mind. Number one, when we were talking about Henry George, and you know, everybody wants to clump together. And I know this, he's writing a little later in time, but one thinks of James Fenimore Cooper's uh, Natty Bumpo, who uh, the, the last thing in the world he wanted to do was to have society uh, encroach upon him and he'd just go further west. Of course, that has to do you know, with ultimate closing the frontier. But the other thing was, uh, you know, talk about this, no mention, I always think of Tinkets to Tinker to Evers to Chance, the, great double play combination for the Chicago Cubs a century ago, or more than a century ago. I always think of that as Hamilton to Clay to Lincoln with the American system, you know, which everybody calls Clay's American system. You, you know, when you talk about political economy, I mean, that, you know, to my uh, way of looking at it, encapsulates a whole bunch of the political economy that dominated the country from before. I mean, obviously, it played an important part in going from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution, but then on through until we, shall we say, settled the matter with, uh, with the war in 1861. Uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, Henry Clay is another figure that I could have included here, and there's still other figures. Uh, that I that could have included here, uh, but I didn't. Uh, I do need uh, a representative of, or some representatives of, the American system. And uh, my notion is that between Hamilton uh, and Henry Carey, uh, I've given you the American system. Henry Clay uh, coined the term. Henry Clay's meaning uh, of the American system actually goes beyond what I want to talk about here. Uh, for Henry Clay, the American system had a few different pillars. Again, uh, although here you can see the, 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 the politics being very close in view, very, very close. I mean, Henry Clay was above all a, a, a politician of a few different, in a, in a, in a number of different roles. Uh, but for, for Clay, in addition to uh, protection for uh, uh, U.S. manufacturers, uh, <clears throat> there, was, uh, there was also uh, the fostering of Republican ideas throughout the hemisphere uh, and uh, also the emphasis on uh, internal improvements. And uh, there are uh, other thinkers uh, who uh, helped to develop the American system uh, who were uh, were rather uh, more uh, apprehensive uh, than was Clay uh, about uh, the, the spread of, uh, fostering the spread of uh, American models of governance throughout the hemisphere. Uh, 
and, and I would say that that was true for uh, Henry Carey. It wasn't as relevant to him, and in as much as it was relevant, uh, it was rather more apprehensive about it. Um, so no, there are other people that I could have included. Uh, Clay would be nice in some respect uh, because uh, he would uh, help to emphasize uh, the political element in the development uh, of American uh, economic theories of development. On the other hand, um, I think that there were more original economic thinkers uh, than Henry Clay. And he was fantastic. I mean, he was a, a, a beautiful rhetorician, um, uh, an ingenious uh, politician, and uh, I think a great, uh, a great thinker, a great statesman. Um, I don't think he was as creative as an economic theorist uh, as either Cox and Hamilton on one hand and Carey on the other. Uh, and also, it's his relationship to the frontier that I think would complicate my complicate my story. Um, but you're right, he, uh, he, he does have a, a place if, if I were to talk even longer. Okay guys, that's it, we are out of time. Thank you so much.